Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. We're waking up with watches and everything you see is for sale and in stock. Reach out to me, T Mosso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details of any of these watches. But this time of year, heading toward the holidays, we sell what we buy, we buy what we sell. We are looking to build an inventory, sell us one watch or an entire collection, no upper limit on value paid. We pay cash, we pay fast, we wire it directly, we walk you through the process and we make it a no-brainer. Alternatively, trade a watch or watches you're not wearing for watches you will love. To buy, trade, or sell, reach out to T Mosso at thewatchbox.com for pricing details. From 2017 forward, Rolex offered a number of solid gold Oyster Flex clad Daytona models, and this is my favorite of that crop. A watch that looks for all the world more like a modern Paul Newman than the new Paul Newman. It's a timepiece that has an irresistible combination of black, yellow, and red. A motorsports themed chrono that can also be used for swimming or Excel as your dress watch. This is one of the most versatile watches Rolex has ever made. Now, it's only 47.7 millimeters from lug to lug, so it's fairly compact. 40 millimeters in diameter. It has this lovely matte black dial with subtle red printing, gold on black two-tone. We have applique indices, and the watch features plenty of Rolex chromolite blue loom. Screw-down crown. It's actually a trip lock. This is what a gold trip lock looks like on a Rolex. Three dots with the big dot in the middle. Rolex crowns always have material and type codes. The Oyster Flex is actually a bracelet. I debuted in 2015 on the Yachtmaster. It's a nickel titanium alloy inside and rubber on the outside. People think it's a strap, but it can't be cut. The flip side of that is it can't tear, so this watch is going to stay put. There's a bellows system on the bottom that helps to take up any slack, cinch it down, and as you can see, Oyster Flex is not a nickname. It is properly the name of this strap bracelet. Opening up the clasp, you can see thick gauge, gold, and then inside we have the Easy Link tool free adjustment system, and then three pairs of divots. So you can use your strap tool to dismount the spring bar and change the anchoring point here. You can see what the bellows look like on the underside. It's a Rolex, so a solid case back, and it's a pre owned watch, so full disclosure, there are some little marks on there. But the watch overall is in excellent condition, especially topside, where the sapphire and the scratch resistant ceramic bezel help to block any blows. Easy watch to wear, really comfortable. As you can see, it fits well on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist, and it's got a three day power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel, shock resistant, water resistant, anti magnetic, hacking seconds, 72 hour power reserve. This watch is stacked, and I do think one of the most dramatic modern cosmographs. Forget the so called John Mayers, those were predictable. Everyone saw those coming. A lot of folks in the marketplace today don't even know this watch exists and they're not looking for it. That's why I highly recommend anyone who has the inclination to get in now. Okay, change of pace here. Richard Page was one of the original founders of Time Zone and fourth generation watchmaker. He's retired from Time Zone these days. He works out of Hawaii where he builds watches and the R Page brand is his own. He sent this over to me and I thought I'd share it with you. It, first, because I love the fact that he's repurposing vintage American pocket watch dials and movements and that's exactly what we got right here. But you get this sort of minimalist packaging. The box, the sleeve, there's a little card that holds the watch and then a wallet. Again, that's perfect. Enough to feel like high quality, but not so much that you need to lease a second residence in order to store your watch box. Now, this is 44 millimeters across. It's called the Rocket, and surprisingly, it's only $3,800. I say surprisingly because first, it's got a vintage movement with a porcelain, or I should say enamel dial, and this is the Montgomery dial, which was created by Henry S. Montgomery in the late 19th century to offer greater resolution than the Webster Ball mandated railroad code Arabic numerals because there are minutes in between these five minute increments. So fully calibrated, it's easier to avoid, say, crashing into a train that's two or three minutes ahead. Also important, this is why I think it's unusual that the watch is only $3,800. What appears like it might be, I don't know, laser ablated or drill applied banknote scrolling. This is actually the real thing. He had a number of cases hand engraved. So this florisin, which is a floral pattern, sort of art nouveau, pre-art deco. This is all done by hand on the bezel and the case. You can see the lugs have this beautiful art deco style tiered design. Well, that is art deco. Everything else is art nouveau, pre-art deco, a really cool look. There's an ostrich leg leather strap. You've seen the quill style ostrich. This is an unusual but intriguing cut. You can see the contrasting stitch to match the dial, but this is ostrich leg 
simple R page pin buckle. You can see it used to be a Savonette style pocket watch. It really does set quite beautifully and nothing winds and sets like a well-maintained vintage pocket watch movement. Elgin was the brand out of Elgin, Illinois. I know some people ask how it's supposed to be pronounced. People from Illinois tell me Elgin, although the Scottish original would have been Elgin back in Scotland. So you can see the modern hands, they look like vintage, but they're cathedral style with Luminova. And then you can see it is an original enamel dial with a little bit of a chipping and you can see the original hand for the second subdial has been retained. So yes, there's some patina here and there are marks of wear but these are like battle scars marks of distinction as the movement which is a grade 314 model 2 has survived really nicely 15 jewel it's got some nice features here including a mosley micrometric steel adjustment index a blued Breguet overcoil hairspring. You can see it's got a split bimetallic balance. And although you can't see it, there's a double roller, which is a mark of distinction on high grade watches, helping to properly bracket and locate the horns of the lever. Uh, on the impulsing jewel. You can also see a few things that I love, like the damaskining and the nickel finish, as well as the use of chaton to fix the pivot jewels. This isn't an affectation like Longa. This movement was made in 1918. This is actually how the movements were made back then. Beautiful solarization on the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel. Uh, the one thing I would have done a little bit differently if I were Richard is I probably would have refinished all these screws. I probably would have black polished them on like 3M lapping paper and maybe re-slotted them with a ruby triangle file, but there is something to be said for leaving all the original marks, the marks of age on the watch. That is, that's just a philosophical difference. And then you can see that there's that lovely damaskining across all the surfaces. It's a big movement. You can see it's a large watch, but not arbitrarily so. It's got to fit this vintage pocket watch caliber inside. Big slow 2.5 hertz beat rate and about 35 hours of power reserve, so you're going to wind it daily. But wouldn't you want to? I don't look at that as an inconvenience at all. I will say as big as it is, you do need a wrist of at least 16 centimeters to wear it. So there you go. I, I think my wrist is borderline. I could pull it off, but if my wrist were smaller, I couldn't. So reach out to Richard or you can reach out to me at tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. I will refer you to him. I like to support independent creators. I'm not making a cent off that. So here we have a watch that's actually a 2022 update of a model originally launched in 2014. This is the Nautilus 5991A. It's the Dash 011 model. So a couple of things change. First, you've got a new blue gradient dial, still a flyback chronograph, still a dual time with a little system that allows you to superimpose the two hour hands if you don't need them and clean up the dial. You get both a local and reference time AM PM. And you can see there's even a little radial style date indicator. You can drive the date forward or backwards depending on which way you are crossing the international date line there. So it's very adaptable. All this 120 meters water resistant, very well loomed, still under 13 millimeters thick. It's 40, it's about 40.5, 40.8 millimeters in diameter. This is the most versatile watch Patek Philippe makes. Steel, graceful, sure, you could wear it formal but it's also a sports watch, of course, with the water resistance, the automatic winding, the steel construction. And there have been some changes here that I want to shout out. This was new for 2022, and it's something I suspect you'll start to see across the line in sports watches from Patek. You have these two little micrometric indexed sliders that allow you to make fine tuning changes to the fit. We also have this new clasp design you can see with the little flourish of the Calatrava cross which you can see in its entirety externally. So that's a really cool system. That's something I'm glad Patek offers. You can also see how Gerald Genta's original Nautilus design is retained fully intact. You can't see much of the caliber 28520 on the reverse side, but it's automatic winding. It's a 55 hour power reserve. It's a flyback. It's a dual time. And it's a four hertz beat rate, free sprung, gyromax style balance, anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, negative three plus two seconds per 24 hours or better per Patek and vertical clutch and column wheel, meaning the column wheel gives you that crisp pusher feel, and the vertical clutch gives you super smooth engagement. Just a wonderful watch. Expensive, yes, but beautifully finished and so versatile. If you were going to be a one-watch guy, this would be it. 
something very different and undoubtedly more accessible, but probably less common. This is a 100-piece limited edition, 40 millimeters in titanium. It's the Moser Pioneer Center Seconds Rotating Bezel, Govberg US Edition. Now, 100 pieces made, 40 millimeters. This is what a lot of people think the Pioneer should have been from the beginning. Full bracelet, 40 millimeters, rotating bezel, much more wearable in titanium. It's incredibly compact at just over 47 millimeters from lug to lug. It's actually under 12 millimeters thick. Super chunky bezel action, so you've got that zero to 60 minute count up timer. Solid blocks of loom applied to the dial. This is Globalite, it's a ceramic based loom. Moser with their famed Fume Fe dial. And people ask me, what is this bezel insert? And I guessed it was aluminum based on the way it looked. I asked Edward Melon, the CEO, he's like, I'll get back to you. Three weeks later, the answer comes back, it's actually an insert made of titanium. But the cool thing is, it features inserts within the insert made of that globalite ceramic. So you get a fully luminescent bezel that is super chatty. If you love chunky bezels with a great mechanical feel, batter up. Inside, we have Moser's Caliber HMC200, automatic winding, very shock tolerant, three-day power reserve, and it does have hacking seconds. Plus, we have a push-button slider via a little rack and lock system internally, so you get some fine-tuning built into the clasp. This is a 100-piece series. It's sold out fast, but because we originally sold them, when they come back to the pre-owned market, we're generally the people who get the first right of refusal to buy them, which is why periodically we do have one of these. And again, this is a watch that came out this year. So being available pre-owned right now, this is a rare opportunity. And in my opinion, probably the coolest Moser Extant. That said, I love the color green. And if, like me, you feel that way, this is probably going to be your default choice, the famed Green Dragon. Technically, it was never called the Green Dragon. That's a nickname that enthusiasts came up with. This was formerly Matrix Green. It was from 2020, a very short run. These watches have already been superseded by the smoked salmon dial. It's smaller than the Streamliner Flyback at 40 millimeters by 12 millimeters thick. You can see it's got the same beautifully organic, fully integrated bracelet. It's inspired by a combination of watches of the 70s and streamlined trains of the 1930s, and I can see both. Now, it's not as extensively loomed as the dive watch, which is why I think the dive watch is probably just a little bit more versatile and usable, but you do get broadly loomed hour and minute hands, so you can more or less guess. Now, both of these watches are water resistant to 120 meters. I just think that the utility of the bezel is going to make that the watch that gets the nod from me, but mechanically they're identical. They have the same HMC 200. The only difference is that some of these 100 feature tungsten rotors, whereas all of the Streamliner center seconds featured the rose gold rotor. And again, three-day power reserve, hacking seconds, all of that, recessed case band. Every Moser has a case band recession. They feature different internal sculpting and patterns, so you can see the distinction there. Uh, for my money, this bracelet is just a little bit more special than the bracelet on the Pioneer. You can see the intricacy of the finish, and the price of this watch reflects that. It takes a long time to build and finish this bracelet. But I love the way it fits. I love the way it looks. I do think that the Pioneer center second wears a little bit smaller. Even though this watch does not wear large, there is some rigidity to the bracelet. You can see it flares out a little bit. I can't pull the bracelet straight down. Whereas on this watch, I pretty much can pull the bracelet straight down. So the, even though they're the same size, technically 40 millimeters, the diver wears a little bit smaller. Now this is a watch that can slide under a cuff. Really both of them are, so it's just gonna come down to your stylistic preference. Both of those watches out of production, highly sought, but both worth pursuing. And again, we offer a no questions asked return policy. Try it out for seven days. Send it back if you don't like it. That's how our system has always worked. Okay, here is a watch that is a collaboration from 2021 between Paterai and Brabus, a 100-piece limited edition in titanium and Carbotech. It's probably not what you're thinking. If you're familiar with Brabus, you know that they are a car tuner known for tuning German cars. Well, Brabus also makes boats. And so at the 2021 Monaco Yacht Show, this 100-piece edition was launched alongside Brabus Black Squadron Day Boats, which are power boats that look tactical, but are, you know, 
quite honestly, for luxury cruising. Well, the watch itself is packed with all sorts of features, and we'll start from the outside and work our way in. Let's start with Lume. Well, every submersible Panerai is an extension of the Luminor line, and you can see Luminor indeed. Take a look. I've got luminescent seconds, hours, minutes. The minute hand is blue, so you can easily read it against the bezel pearl, which is huge, so it's easy to keep track of the passage of time in the dark. You can also see, and I'll show you here, that there's actually a second hour hand for the second time zone, I had them superimposed. There's an AM PM indicator over at nine o'clock and the AM PM, like the second sand, which is coaxial with it, is actually visible. So you have the second time zone, you know whether you're looking at day or night in that second time zone, and then the other three hands for local time are all entirely visible. This is a really cool watch. Oh, one more thing. Look at the second sand over at nine o'clock. When I pull the crown out all the way, it's zero resets straight to the index at 60. So not only do we have hacking seconds here, but we have a zero reset system, so it's easy to set the watch to the second against a reference time. The dial's fully skeletonized, and there's actually a, a little hidden date in here. And the date is a sapphire disc that rotates under this grill, and it's sort of backlit or highlighted on a satin metal plane that sits behind the disc. So you could see the date as the time advances. Let's see. So you have a date, a second time zone, a day-night indicator, zero reset seconds, micro rotor automatic winding, a three-day power reserve. You have a wonderfully loud, just obnoxiously loud dive bezel. All of this in Carbotech, so no two will have the exact same case lines. And there's a power reserve indicator in the form of a sapphire disc on the reverse side, a tungsten micro rotor. We're braced against shock here with a full balance bridge and a free sprung balance. It all pivots on 31 joules at 4 hertz. This is one of the last really over engineered Panerai in house calibers. Now, you know, we get stuff like the P900 that's Valfleurier, it's not really Panerai. And Panerai started big with its in-house calibers in 2005, and this movement represents the old school of Panerai in-house caliber design. It's an all-out attempt that's been fully skeletonized and blackened, so not only is it technically impressive, it's aesthetically impressive. We have a combination textile and rubber strap. The watch comes with a second textile strap with red stitching, and it's 47 millimeters, but being all sapphire titanium for the metal, and carbon, it's very light. 300 meter diver, yes it's big, but big is the look with Panerai, so the overhanging lugs here aren't as offensive to me as they would be if this were say a Brigade dress watch. And then this is a 100 piece limited edition, so good luck finding another. You can even see the barrel open through this little aperture on the dial side, a really cool watch. It has the famed Panerai lever-based locking device protecting the crown and all aspect protection for the crown assembly. So this is probably a Panerai for the guy who's not a Panerai traditionalist. If you're a Paneristo, but you like complications, you like rarity, limited editions, you like the luxury angle of Panerai watchmaking, then this Brabus partnership, the limited production, the exotic material, the complications, the skeleton dial and movement, this is gonna to speak to you. You know what's incredible? When you can get a watch like this for under $10,000. In 2014, Oris celebrated its 110th anniversary, and via a collaboration with two other companies, one of which was actually a school, the Horological School of Laloque, uh, Oris created this caliber 110 for 110 years of Oris, its first modern in-house caliber. The caliber is huge at about 35 millimeters in diameter with a gigantic mainspring barrel and a 240-hour 10-day power reserve. You can see that it's actually impressively finished with circular satination on the wheel, vertical satination on the bridges. All the screw heads are polished, but now take a look at the bevels. These are hand-finished bevels, deeply impressive. You can also see that the same treatment has been lavished on the, the screw sinks. And then on the dial side, we have this non-linear power reserve indicator. By the way, the watch 43 millimeters in rose gold, it's a 110 piece limited edition. It is loomed. The way this power reserve indicator works is it actually accelerates as it reaches the end of its run because the mainspring has a flat torque curve from about 10 days of power reserve down to about one and a half remaining. After that, it starts to lose a lot of its torque and the amplitude starts to fluctuate. So Oris 
measured and indexed the flattest part of the torque curve, and then they built this cammed nonlinear power reserve indicator to make it obvious it would be moving fastest as it approached the end to alert you that you're approaching the point at which the watch is still going to run but not keep the best time. That's why it has this nonlinear design, which is underpinned by this double snail cam system on the reverse. And so that's exactly what that is. It is a variable speed power reserve indicator. And it's a high grade dial. You can see opaline satination. We have rose gold cabochon indices and then inboard faceted rectangular hour indices. And it's a big watch, but look at these lugs. Finely shaped, handsomely sculpted, stepped out from the case band. The watch is admirably thin at under 14 millimeters. This is a much better alternative for your money than something like an IWC Portuguese automatic seven day. Even though the seven day is an automatic admittedly, and this is a manual wine 10, they're so similar in style. I consider this to be the horological equivalent of the IWC and possibly even more graceful on the wrist. A really cool piece from Oris and great value. Here's a piece that it's based on the third generation overseas. It's the Overseas Ultra Thin Perpetual Calendar. The standard perpetual calendar came out in colored gold back in 2016. This was a 2021 launch with a blue dial in white gold. A really cool piece, super slim at only 8.3 millimeters thick. And unlike the other generation three overseas, the ultra thin models have a bracelet that'll pull straight down out of the lug for better fit on a smaller wrist. Now they still have a lot of the features that make the generation three great including the quick release lug system and two accessory straps. The watch comes with one rubber strap in blue and one leather strap in blue, plus a second accessory clasp to use with those straps. Now, if you look, every single link on both sides of the bracelet is removable for fine tuning the fit, but each side of the clasp also features a sleeved micro adjustment. You can see that right there. You have a sleeved micro adjustment so you get 1.5 millimeters of tool-free adjustment on each side. And then you can see the intricacy of the finish on this bracelet in white gold. And it's the good stuff too, gray gold, the kind that's white and never needs to be plated. Vacheron uses the good stuff. Okay, dial, black polished metal base with a translucent lacquer on top, white gold hands, white gold indices, lovely perpetual calendar that can be split with cruciform symmetry. And then we have actually plenty of loom right here, no shortage. The perpetual calendar, of course, needing no adjustment during leap years or irregular length months. All of this driven by Vacheron's 21, or I should say that that's what AP calls it. Vacheron calls the JLC 920 based movement the 1120. So this is the 1120 slash three. Distantly based on the 1967 JLC 920 created on commission for Vacheron, AP, and Patek, the movement's only ever been used by the Holy Trinity and never by JLC's other customers or JLC itself. There are four different forms of hand finishing on the rotor, which is made of 22 karat gold, not 21, not 18, not rose gold plated tungsten. We have a free sprung gyromax style balance beating at a vintage 19,800 vibrations per hour. Beveling, as well as beveling on the jewel and screw sinks, you can see on the edge of the bridge, in the jewel and the screw sinks, beautifully hand applied. It is Geneva Hallmark, but not just the movement. Also, you can see this is a full watch standard since mid 2012. 40 hour power reserve. There's a beryllium ring that runs all the way around the movement. You can see the beveling, the stripes, the solarization on the ratchet wheel, gorgeous stuff. That ring allows the mast to be sunken really close to the bridges without any danger of it crashing into them under impact because four ruby roller bearings support that beryllium ring. So you never have contact between the rotor, the mass, and the bridges and plates of the movement. Just a wonderful watch, 41.5 millimeters in diameter, but only 8.3 millimeters thick. It wears super slender and because you can pull the bracelet straight down around the wrist it wears wonderfully a timepiece that is large but not so large I wouldn't wear it myself I recommend it for wrists of 15 centimeters circumference and up and a very special and rare modern Vacheron overseas Romain Gautier started making watches back in the 2000s but it was in 2013 with the launch of the Logical One and its victory at the GPHG in the complication category that put Romain Gautier on the map. He's an engineer. 
and a businessman. He's not a watchmaker. So he drew on the finishing traditions of his native Valais de Jeux, most notably from a mentor named Philippe Dufour. And so you could see the standards of watch finish espoused by Dufour and others in the area present and correct. 43 millimeters in white gold. We have welded on lugs with media blasted recesses. We have a dial and sub dial of fired enamel. We have a mechanism with a snail cam and a chain, and there are actually 26 individual ruby pivot jewels inside this chain. I don't know how well you can see them. You can see them from this angle. You wind the watch in its 46-hour power reserve using a pusher over at 9 o'clock, and because there's a stop works to halt the action before the watch starts keeping time badly with low mainspring wind, the second you press the pusher, it starts running because it has a reserve of energy. A stop works ensures that the watch stops while it still has some energy in the barrel, so it starts up every time. You can see Gautier's distinctive wheel in a wheel design. Those are his wheels, his own free-sprung balance. Look at the black polishing, the satination, the sharp exterior points where bevels meet, the sharp interior angles where bevels meet, this steel bridge where you have the snail cam and then you have the barrel. So this, this wheel is driven by the barrel, the snail cam effectively acting as a fusee or a constant force device. So as the barrel winds down and its mainspring torque diminishes, the length of the lever arm being pulled increases as the snail increases in its diameter. So you can see the snail expands as the energy winds down. So for 46 hours, constant force. And this is better than a standard constant force fusee because it uses less space and it keeps the chain on the cam and the wheel in the same plane for better efficiency. You can actually adjust the watch using this little crown up at two o'clock, and then the dial, which features, well, it basically is the movement. There's a combination of polish and media blast. You can see snailing on the balance cock, and on the reverse side, we have an open barrel that's actually sapphire lined to reduce internal friction, a power reserve indicator, and you can see the width of these bevels inspired by Dufour, and how deeply drawn those interior angles are within these hollows. It is gorgeous. It represents the upper limit of what is possible with hand finishing. It is, however, a big watch. That is the one thing I will advise. On my wrist, I'm sort of at the limit of what's possible. These lug spans are broad. Check out my standalone review of the watch, which you'll find easily on our channel. But I would wear this watch. I just wouldn't recommend it for wrists smaller than 16 centimeters circumference. If you want a smaller watch, you want to look at something like a Romain Gautier Insight Micro Rotor. But if you want the Romain Gautier, the watch that will probably be his best known piece until the day he dies, and he's a young man now, it's gonna be the logical one. Discontinued for several years now. When a lot of people think top of the market, chiming watches, high horology finish, and utmost exclusivity, you might think Jorn, you might think Vacheron, you might think Grubel Forcy, or particularly Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet. But what about Ulysse Nardin? Here we have a watch from the 2000s, made 42 millimeters in white gold, black lacquer dial. This is a Jacquemart Striker three strike automaton minute repeater. So the Jacquemart or the Strikers are little automata on clocks, and in this case, on a miniaturized version of a striking clock, and they move in conjunction with the strikes. So I'm gonna set this watch to 1259, or as close as I can get, and allow you to enjoy a facet of Ulysse Norden that's almost never mentioned. Now the case is distinctively Ulysse Norden, but everything else is gonna come as a shock. This is high horology at the highest level. From the watchmaking, that is the engineering, to the finishing. The fit for a wrist 16 centimeters circumference or larger, excellent. It's even fairly thin. The combination of the black dial and the white metal makes it versatile. And on the reverse side, we have the most traditional of movement architectures featuring a combination of crown wheel, barrel, center wheel, and then finger trains leading down to the escapement. And you can see this is take no prisoners finish. Black polished strikers polished on their tops and beveled on their sides with sharp exterior points. 
one, two, three, four sharp interior angles on the bridge retaining the strikers. Black polished gongs that run all the way around. We have more interior angles on the bridge for the center wheel and then the deepest jewel hollows I've ever seen. Mirror polished adjacent to solarization on the ratchet wheel. You can see that there is engine turning on the plate below. Solarization on the crown wheel and crown wheel core. Stripes beautifully broad and luminous across the bridges. Anglage a mile wide. Engine turning on the base plate. A black polished swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism. This movement created in the late 80s for Ulysse Norden by a short-lived collaboration of Renault, Papy, and Christophe Claret. And that is the often unspoken story between these Ulysse Norden striking watches. That's where this movement comes from, the ultimate in pedigree. If you love this watch or any of these, reach out to me. I am T. Masso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.